Welcome to Clothes Horse, the podcast that is just a Barbie podcast in a Barbie world. Seriously, I've been humming that Aqua song uncontrollably all week. Please tell me I'm not the only one. (laughs) I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 169. As always, I'm very excited about this week's episode. You all know I'm a very excitable person. And my guest this week is award-winning journalist and sustainable fashion expert, Alden Wicker. She's here to talk about her new book, To Die For, How Toxic Fashion is Making Us Sick and How We Can Fight Back. We'll be talking about the chemicals on brand new clothing being sold right now, what the impact of these chemicals is, and yes, it is major nightmare fuel, and what we can do to protect ourselves. But first, I wanted to talk to you about something totally different from that, and that is the summer of Barbie. First things first, I was very excited about the movie and I saw it last night with Dustin and I loved it. I laughed so much. I had such a great time. You know, this month has been kind of overwhelming for me because when I put in my two weeks notice at my job last month, I started booking consulting clients, recording sessions for Clothes Horse, all these other things. And two days before that, like two weeks notice was up, My employer asked me to stay until the end of July to finish up some projects. I was like, okay, well, I can't say no to that money, but this month has been exhausting. I've been working long days at my soon-to-be-old job, then working nights and weekends with clients and on close source stuff and small biz big pick and also just trying to like live my life. So I've been really tired, kind of burned out, a little bit of a stress case. There's also something like, I don't know, working at my job, but not really working at it, like not being the person in charge anymore and seeing changes happening already. That is like, I don't know, it's kind of like depressing, sad, frustrating. I don't know, demoralizing. I don't know, only negative feelings. So I've also just been in this really weird headspace for the past month, uh, just dealing with that and also thinking about like what's coming next, like what's our financial situation going to be, where are we going to move, like blah, blah, blah. You know, you know how it goes. So yeah, this month has been a lot. I've been really tired, kind of burned out. And this movie felt like the ultimate treat. I can't recommend it enough. Honestly, it was such a great escape for this period of time. And it was so fun. And it just made me so happy. Dustin and I also realized that this was the first time since we were kids that we'd seen like a summer blockbuster film because they're usually, you know, action movies or based on comic books. And that's like not our scene. So this was a big departure that ultimately caters to a very different audience that usually doesn't get big summer movies. And really, from a a mega capitalist, make as much money as possible perspective, this was a very, very smart decision for both the movie studio and Mattel. It's also kind of lifting up the entire retail industry alongside it. The thing about Barbie is that, you know, she's baked into a lot of our memories. Some of us were and are indifferent, but we saw a lot of commercials for Barbie as kids, and we at least ran by the pink aisle at Toys R Us on our way to the Legos. But for others, and that includes me, Barbie was our favorite toy. I mean, I spent hours and hours and hours acting out stories with my Barbies, making clothes and furniture for them. I definitely played with my share of Barbie coloring books and paper dolls when I was in the hospital, because if you recall, I had cancer as a kid. And Barbie was actually a great sick kid toy because it was something I could do inside. It was something I could take to the hospital with me, doctor's appointments. I mean, I loved Barbie. But no matter who you are, Barbie unlocks a little memory portal in your brain and it makes you, I don't know kind of, or even a lot excited about the movie. Earlier this year, we did two episodes of my other podcast, The Department, about a new retail and social trend called cadulting. And I'll link to those episodes in the show notes because I think they're really fun and informative, at least according to me. (laughs) 
Essentially, cadulting, if you've not heard that term before, it refers to a rise in sales of toys and toy-related products to adult customers. And no, I know what you're thinking, aren't all toys bought by adults? Because, you know, they're the ones with, like, the wallets and the credit cards and the checking accounts and such. Sure, that's true. But we're talking about adults specifically buying toys for themselves. In fact, right now, these adults are the only reason the toy industry is growing because toy sales have been kind of lackluster for the past few years. Some examples of companies who are leaning into this new trend are Lego. Lego is killing it in the world of adulting. 20% of their total sales are now adults buying sets for themselves. And they did this by developing a line just for adults featuring things like video game systems, succulents, Van Gogh paintings, dream cars. I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of nostalgia baked into some of these Lego sets and kind of like the most expensive Lego sets. I saw one that was based on one of the first Atari game systems. It was really cool. Like you even built like little sort of like dioramas of the individual games along with building like the physical video game system. And I was like, oh, like Dustin would think this was really cool, but it was like $300. And then I was like, when's he gonna have time to put together Legos? But like really impressive. Like I could get the desire to buy these things. They are definitely so smart about putting that nostalgia into the product assortment, right? Next, there's American Girl. By the way, American Girl is owned by Mattel, who also owns Barbie, and they have been cashing in on this adult customer by introducing dolls from the 80s and 90s that are specifically, you guessed it, nostalgic to millennials. And they have added alcohol and more adult kind of food to their cafe menus, you know, like kale. (laughs) Okay, I don't know if kale's there, but I remember seeing like a salmon salad or something, like not just chicken fingers. You know what? It's working. Like adults are going in, they're going out to dinner at the American Girl Cafe and they are buying dolls on their way out. Did you notice how I've only talked about two companies so far that are really doing well in this world of adulting? And I said nostalgia when I talked about both of them. I just want you to keep listening for that because that's a big piece of all of this. Next, we have Squishmallows, which are cute, but to be honest, not very special plushies. Um, By the way, plushies is what the kids call them these days. We used to maybe call them stuffed animals. So Squishmallows, it's wild. 65% of their total sales are adults buying them for themselves. I call Squishmallows 21st century beanie babies because they're just like everywhere. There's this like gotta catch them all collection aspect of it. There are definitely people who think they appreciate and value and maybe they do. If you want to get really upset about overconsumption and future landfill contents, go check the Squishmallows hashtag on TikTok, which I can only do periodically because I get too anxious. If you want to continue to get get anxious about uh, overconsumption and plastic and landfills, uh, also check out Funko Pops and Lounge Fly Bags. These are also things that people collect and they are based on pop culture and there's a lot of nostalgia in there as well. But going back to Squishmallows and plushies as a whole, adults are big consumers of plushies right now with brands like Squishables selling higher priced plush to adult customers. We're talking things that are 40, 50, 60 plus dollars. Even Build-A-Bear Workshop has an adults-only section on their website. And I, Before you get too titillated, it's mostly just bears that like to party with alcohol. But <laughs> still, it's an adult customer. You'll have to be 18 plus to enter. Other brands are killing it in this era of adulting, even if they're not explicitly making toys. We're talking about Sanrio, for example, who has been expanding into partnerships with beauty, clothing, and shoe brands, selling higher priced items to adults. There's a lot of nostalgia playing into that, though, too, because we've reached this point where generations of people have been buying Sanrio stuff, right? 
Um, I've talked about this before on the department. I'm not sure if I've talked about it here, but years ago I was in Japan and one of the things on my list of things to do was to take the limited run, although it's still running now, Hello Kitty Shinkansen, which is a bullet train. And it was, honestly, it was super fun because it's like painted with Hello Kitties on the outside. The decor is fully Hello Kitty inside from the curtains to the seats to all the wall decor. The first two cars are, you can go drink special Hello Kitty tea and buy little tchotchkes and it's all very cute. And the thing that moved me most about this experience is that generations of women were taking the trip together. It would be the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter, all three having grown up with Hello Kitty. It was just so touching to me. Meanwhile, I was there with Dustin He was one of very few men on the train. (laughs) He's a really good sport. (laughs) Anyway, there's another important thing to call out here is that this adulting trend doesn't stop at toys. It's the adult Happy Meal that McDonald's put out last year. It's home textiles and clothing and shoes and collabs with luxury brands. Beauty brands have been doing collabs with Hello Kitty, Barbie, Sailor Moon, Powerpuff Girls, and so much more. Just about every Disney character, someone did a makeup line based on them. There are a few things at the core of this adulting trend. One is changing attitudes about aging and what adulthood means, and I am here for that. After all, who says you have to stop having fun or playing or being excited about things just because you're an adult? Next is, yeah, you saw this coming, nostalgia, which, you know, we need more than ever right now. Life is hard and scary, and many of us are struggling with, let's see, the political climate, the actual ever-warming climate of our planet, um, money worries, health issues, so much more. And being an adult is really hard. And you know what? Nostalgia is comforting. It gives us a little bit of a mental break. Interestingly enough, nostalgia is also great for business. According to a 2014 study by the Journal of Consumer Research, we are more likely to spend money when we feel nostalgic. There's something about nostalgia that makes people feel less like they need to hold on to their money. It's very odd, but I think it's about the connection that nostalgia brings us, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment, that really drives that spending. According to the study, quote, we found that when people have higher levels of social connectedness and feel that their wants and needs can be achieved through the help of others, their ability to prioritize and keep control over their money becomes less pressing. The study also implied that leaning into nostalgia during a recession can help get reluctant customers to spend more money. And guess what? Right now, retailers are having a hard time getting people to spend money on non-essential items because essential items like food, housing, and healthcare are so expensive. Put a pin in that idea because we're going to talk about it in terms of the summer of Barbie in a few minutes. Nostalgia also creates community and connection, which is harder to find right now. Think about it. All of us grew up with the same television shows, toys, and commercials in the background of our lives. Basically, this created an entire generation that has all of these commercial properties like Rainbow Bride and My Little Pony, McDonald's Happy Meals, and of course, Barbie as the backdrop of their memories. From the cartoons and their theme songs to the toys to the other stuff They are baked into everything we remember. We are attached to these characters and toys and shows. And even if we were kind of meh about, say, the Care Bears back then, if we see something related to it now, whether it's candy, a magnet, even just a pen, we're more likely to buy it because it makes us feel good. It feels more important than it should be. And because we share these memories with so many other people, because these things were all mass produced, it's easy to find others, thanks to social media, who share those fond memories. 
you can make friends and build entire communities around this nostalgia. There is a subreddit for just about any toy or cartoon from our childhood. Many of us who have never met IRL who live in very different geographical places, we have similar stories about McDonald's birthday parties or playing Mall Madness or watching the Smurfs. We read the same Goosebumps and Babysitter's Club books. These commodities, these commercial properties, all of these things that were sold to us are also the threads that connect us. Is it kind of sad? Sure. But it also does create the sense of connection with more people, kind of makes it easier to find common ground with people who might be different from you in other ways. So I don't know, it's kind of a good thing. That's me trying to be optimistic about it. So back to Barbie. Mattel, the company that makes Barbie, is very excited about the movie, too, because Barbie sales have been pretty weak over the past few years, and Mattel had a really tough 2022. In fact, the doll industry as a whole is elated because analysts believe that the Barbie movie and all of the nostalgia around it will grow sales for that entire industry over the next few years. And of course, A visit to the Mattel website reveals an entire collection of dolls, doll clothing, adult clothing, and other tchotchkes, including a mouse pad, directly from the movie. I personally think, this is just me putting on my, I'm a really good uh, merchandiser and product assortment developer. Uh, I think they missed two great opportunities. One was to sell a version of the dream house from the movie that is actually designed to be used with dolls. They have one that you can build out of blocks. It's not the same. And two, they should have reissued all of the most iconic dolls of the 80s and 90s because I know a lot of people who would want them. Not that I think we should just all go out and buy Barbie stuff right now. More on that in a minute, of course. But just like, come on, Mattel, be smarter. I also just say, Mattel, while you're here listening to me talk, they're not. Let's just pretend they are. Uh, I have a lot of ideas about how American Girl could be better right now. And one of those is like bringing back all the old dolls and their cool stuff. And also maybe making adult size clothing <laughs> from the original American Girl dolls. Okay, I might. If there were a good Kirsten outfit out there in my size, I could easily be persuaded to buy it. I'm just saying. Okay. So Mattel here benefiting from the Barbie movie, of course the toy industry as a whole possibly benefiting too. But all retailers are very excited about this movie as well, but for slightly different reasons. In an economy where it's gotten a lot harder to get people to buy stuff that they don't need, Barbie fever is a chance to sell a lot more stuff. In particular, Retail sales in clothing and anything else remotely non-essential have been sluggish for the past few months. It's no wonder that there are more than 100 deals with various retailers and brands for Barbie-themed clothing and cosmetics collections. Off of the top of my head, and this is clearly not a comprehensive list, I can think of Gap, Old Navy, NYX Cosmetics, ASOS, some weird exclusives with Revolve, Hot Topic, I think probably also Box Lunch. I've seen rollerblades, silk pillowcases, swimsuits, purses, glassware, a new Build-A-Bear option, neon signs, and even, this one's a stretch here, a pasta gift box. So the plan here is to convince consumers that they need a lot of new pink clothes and other tchotchkes to see the movie and to show their love of Barbie. And guess what? Fashion media and really like all media is ready for it. In an era where affiliate links pay the bills for online publications, Barbie listicles and think pieces about how to dress like Barbie as an adult are sure Money makers. By the way, affiliate links mean that the website, say BuzzFeed, gets paid every time a reader clicks a link in the article or the listicle and buys the product linked. 
This is how blogs and websites stay in business at this point. The Barbie movie is a great opportunity to sell more stuff to a customer base who is largely ignored by big blockbuster films. And the Barbie movie brings together generations of people, just like Sanrio. So it's an even bigger audience for listicles and even more people to sell things to. Furthermore, retailers can slap a limited edition or exclusive label on Barbie products so customers don't think twice about buying something lest it run out. They just buy it. So we're seeing every retailer in one way or another selling Barbie stuff, even if it's just curating a pink themed page. Other retailers like Shein, who couldn't get a partnership with Barbie, for once, some good taste there on the part of Mattel. These retailers are bidding lots of money to come up at the top of Google search results for things like Barbie clothes for women. Because here's the thing, in a Google search situation, it's in your best interest to come out of the top because study after study has shown that people don't really go that deep into search results. After a couple of pages, they're sort of over it if they even get that far. So Google allows retailers to bid on certain search terms. I did a reel about it this week on Instagram. You should go check out that that discusses how fast fashion brands like Shein and Cider and other ones as well bid on other brands' names and names of their designs in order to have their knockoffs come up at the top of search results. Um, But also they do it for things like pink dress or Barbie clothes for women or Barbie movie outfit, that kind of stuff. So we've got all of clothing retail here like going hard for Barbie, But we also just have just about every other kind of product also getting into the Barbie merch game or the pink game or whatever they could pull together, right? So just Barbie is like everywhere in retail right now. Here's the thing. You don't need to buy something new or buy something at all other than a ticket to see the movie to participate in the summer of Barbie. In fact, you don't even need to go see the movie if you don't want to to experience this group nostalgia and excitement that we're all having right now. For one, you do not need to get a new outfit to go see a movie in a dark theater. I think that most of us are feeling that urge to buy something new to wear because of the photos we're going to take for social media before or after the movie. And isn't that, bear with me here, the same as buying something new for every party, wedding, date, and birthday? Yes. Yes, it is. And we know that a lot of those sort of single-use clothes end up in landfills really fast and barely worn. If you're not a person who wears pink very often in general, I really don't want you to go buy a new pink outfit, even if it's secondhand, you know? In general, though, I don't think you need to buy anything new, no matter what kind of color you like, in order to participate in the summer of Barbie. I'm just going to keep saying that. Of course, it is so fun to put together a special outfit and take photos, but we don't need to buy something new to do that. Instead, we can make outfits out of things we already own, or we can plan outfits with our friends and swap accessories. I got dressed up for the movie, of course, Wearing a pink hat that Dustin made for me a few years ago, my favorite secondhand selkie dress, which is yellow with pink flowers. I wore pink shoes that I've had since about 2020 and a pink purse that I bought in 2018 in Mexico City. I didn't take any photos, though, because I felt like the Oppenheimer crowd waiting to see their movie in the other theater was going to laugh at me. Also, like, I'm going to be honest. It was kind of sad to go only see it with Dustin, even though we had a great time and I love Dustin. He's the best partner ever and he enjoyed the movie as well. But it would have been so fun to go with a group of friends who were all dressed up. I just don't have that here. And we tried to put together a pink outfit for Dustin, but you might be surprised to hear the pink wardrobe options in his closet were very limited. (laughs) Anyway. That said, I am beyond excited that my favorite color, pink, is having a big 
moment. That doesn't mean that you or any of us have to go buy something pink. You can make a strawberry cake or dye some stained clothing your favorite shade of pink. You can do a special makeup look. You can only eat pink food before or after the movie or for a whole week or for the whole summer, which actually sounds really fun to me and like a challenge. (laughs) You can make special pink drinks for you and your friends. They don't even need to be pink drinks. You can just give them fun Barbie inspired names. That's the fun part of all of this, right? The creativity. But more than that, it's the nostalgia, right? And when it comes to the nostalgia part of it all and the sense of community that comes with it, once again, You don't need to buy anything to be a part of it. You can scroll Pinterest to look at Barbies from your childhood and share photos with your friends. You can do like I did on Saturday and watch old Barbie commercials on YouTube. Dustin and I were laughing so hard. There are so many of them and some of them are so weird and you have to wonder, why did they think kids would want that? (laughs) One of the best things about moments like this, where we are all super excited about something fun happening around us, is the time we spend with other people, reminiscing, laughing, and generally just like being excited together. That's the most important part of it all. That's at its core why retail makes so much money off of nostalgia, That togetherness, the community, and the shared memories are so precious and bring us joy in a time when it can be really hard to be joyful, right? So let's put our wallets away and lean into that. Lean in to one another. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycled clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriella Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a -a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. 
Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage, we are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagavan Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. Okay, so from Barbie to scary stories about clothing, perhaps this episode is the Barbenheimer of slow fashion. Is that too cheesy? (laughs) I don't know. Are you annoyed with me for talking about Barbie so much already? Whatever. I love Barbie. That's that. Anyway, I am excited to jump into my conversation with Alden. In this conversation, she will cite PFAS, which I want to explain to you really quickly in case you haven't heard about them or you've heard that acronym out there, but have been like, I know it's bad, but like, what is it? I just know it's bad, that kind of thing. So the information I'm going to share from you is from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And I'm going to start this off by saying the first five words in this sentence are really difficult to pronounce. So don't judge me. Okay. Quote, per and Polyfluoral alkyl substances, otherwise known as PFAS, are chemicals that resist grease, oil, water, and heat. They were first used in the 1940s and are now in hundreds of products, including stain and water resistant fabrics and carpeting, cleaning products, paints, and firefighting foams. Certain PFAS are also authorized by the FDA for limited use in cookware, food packaging, and food processing equipment. Chemically, individual PFAS can be very different. However, all have a carbon-fluorine bond, which is very strong, and therefore, they do not degrade easily. This is why they're often referred to as forever chemicals, because they're kind of just like together forever, just like Barbie and Ken, except like not like Barbie and Ken after you see the movie. Spoiler. (laughs) 
The widespread use of PFAS and their persistence in the environment means that PFAS from past and current uses have resulted in increasing levels of contamination of the air, water, and soil. Accumulation of certain PFAS has been shown through blood tests to occur in humans and animals. While the science surrounding potential health effects of bioaccumulation is developing, exposure to some types of PFAS have been associated with serious health effects. I'll also just add here that PFAS have been found in dental floss, cosmetics, often from the packaging or because of cross-contamination, but sometimes to make the formulation last longer. Uh, anti-fog eyeglass sprays and wipes, just avoid those, and microwave popcorn bags, which crushes me because there was a period in my life where I ate microwave popcorn for every every day for lunch, and it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it's in this century that scientists are just beginning to understand the impact of these chemicals, and it's pretty scary, especially since so much of it is still unknown. PFAS are just one of the chemicals Alden will be discussing today that can be found on our clothing. So let's jump right in. All right, Alden, very excited to have you here today. Big fan of your work. Uh, Why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? My name is Alden Wicker. I am an independent journalist and the author of To Die For, How Toxic Fashion is Making Us Sick and How We Can Fight Back. So I am guessing that you weren't like eight and on career day, they were like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And you said, oh, I'm totally going to grow up and call out a lot of myths and greenwashing and chemicals and clothing. So can you, or maybe you did, which is incredible. Uh, Can you tell me like (laughs) how you found yourself working to educate others about the truth about the fashion industry? Well, it's been somewhat of a circuitous route. I, hmm. I've i always been interested in sustainability. I, my mom had, I grew up in a Southern town and my I think my mom was the only person in town that had subscriptions to Time and Newsweek. And I would actually <laughs> read, read them and try to absorb whatever wasn't over my head. And so, mm-hmm. um, and I also, we grew up in the woods, you know, I tramp around. And so I actually always cared about environmental issues and I actually started I I have a clear memory of going to shopping at the mall and saying no to plastic bags in Claire's do you remember Claire's Uh, (laughs) forget (laughs) and uh and because I had read about peak oil and I knew plastic Mm -hmm. was made from oil and so um I would try to stuff everything into one uh like limited to shopping bag instead of getting <laughs> a bunch of them. <laughs> but not justice. We're talking limited to not later justice. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so then um I uh I also I wanted to be a journalist uh in college because I actually really loved reading Vogue magazine and mm. as I got further educated I, um, yeah, I graduated and I started blogging about environmental issues. This is back when like everybody had a blog. I had a very typical blog. It was like girl in the city, like sharing my (laughs) life. Uh, and then I relaunched it in 2013 to be a little bit more serious and professional after I quit my job writing about finance, a personal finance for women. So I've always had, uh, I've always had a desire to help people, especially women with serious issues in their life that impact them. And so I started, uh, so I relaunched Eco Cult in 2013. And then a couple weeks later, Rana Plaza, the garment factory in Bangladesh collapsed mm-hmm. uh, and killed more than 1100 people. And at the time, sustainable fashion was deeply uncool. I mean, oh, nobody yeah. wanted to read about it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. I, <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, online women's magazine, Refinery29, uh, there was one editor there, Connie, who uh, gave me a few assignments when she could. Uh, but then mm-hmm. after that, it really accelerated and suddenly... Uh, you know, Newsweek actually was like, why don't you write about sustainable fashion? I pitched wow. everything to Newsweek and they were like, well, are you interested in sustainable fashion? Why don't you write about that? And I was like, no way. You want me to write about sustainable fashion? So here we are. <laughs> uh, over the years, I've written a lot about sustainable fashion and other sustainability topics, but I, I, 
I became disillusioned because it's really hard to get people mm-hmm. to prioritize, not just care about, but by prioritize sustainability and fashion when when they can't see the impact of their choices ever, right? Mm-hmm. We don't see the less carbon being emitted, carbon dioxide being emitted into the air. We don't even know that paying five more dollars for something will make it to the farmer, will make it to the garment worker. And so when I was offered, when I was asked, what do you want to write about by my lovely friend and book agent, Georgia King, I, um, I had heard, I had been asked to, um, comment on a radio show about this lawsuit from, Delta flight attendants against Land's End who made their uniforms because they were making them so sick. And I didn't know anything about it. I had written a lot about the hazardous chemistry in and endocrine disrupting chemicals in beauty products, in plastics. Um, but I had never heard about fashion doing this. And, you know, the, the, illnesses, the reactions that these attendants were having, not only at Delta, but at Alaska before that, American Airlines, Southwest, some regional carriers, they were shocking. They, in some cases, these flight attendants were actually disabled just by being around uniforms that other attendants were wearing. They, they, They just couldn't function. They had racing hearts. They had rashes so bad they bled. Some of them went completely bald. (gasps) <gasps> um, breathing problems so bad they were taken off the airplane to the ER. I mean, just just horrendous. And so once I started researching and pulling on this thread, I had to do a lot of digging to reach people who actually knew what was going on. And I just uncovered this whole underworld where it's this open secret that fashion has chemicals, but they... Like the the party line has been, it's not a big deal. You don't eat your clothes. And also like, yeah, some brands are bad, but like most brands are handling it and it's okay. So like, don't worry about it. And none of <laughs> that is true. <laughs> right, right. I mean, surprise, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me because like, you know, I have worked in the fashion industry my entire adult life as a buyer in fast fashion and like mm-hmm. doing product development, things like that. And, you know, the conversation about chemicals never comes up. And I can assure you that all of the designers and production people I've worked with over the years didn't really know very much about it at either. The only time it might come up is if we were talking about something not passing the flammability test. Uh-huh. And even still, it would be like, oh, well, they're going to go back and redevelop the fabric, which probably meant spray it with more flame retardant, mm-hmm. right? But. Mm-hmm. That's not the that's not the verbiage we used, and certainly no one was saying like, oh, the these decisions that we make might have a negative impact on health or planet, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is if you dig a little bit deeper, you start hearing stories, right? Mm-hmm. You hear stories about uh, production people. I actually talked to, I interviewed a woman for my book who got very sick. Uh, first she developed, so she was in charge of production at a variety of brands and, uh, she first found like had really serious skin issues starting on her hands, right? So she's opening these boxes straight from China and India and South America and, and would just be hit in the face with this very terrible smell. And then she started getting rashes on her hands cause she's checking the seams, making sure that everything's okay. Mm-hmm. And that spiraled, uh, due to fashion, she believes, and I believe, uh, into such serious Crohn's at age 35 that she ended up in the hospital with her organs shutting down. Oh, my God. Yes. And I interviewed um, at least one autoimmune uh, researcher, an expert, who said, yeah, if you don't get your allergies under control, that will spiral into chronic inflammation and autoimmune disease because you're constantly assaulting your body and Mm -hmm. your body ends up being sort of almost traumatized, right? It's sort of like PTSD where, you know, if, if you are traumatized, things that are quote unquote normal to other people will set you off. And that's what's happening in your body. Your, what they're called, they're called mast cells, which are sort of the protectors of the body. They attack toxins, they attack allergens. They start attacking and leading to inflammation if they just encounter like a tiny bit of a chemical that has 
traumatized them before by being like poured onto them. So um, this is all very lay person. I'm not <laughs> like... <laughs> If I sound kind of dumb to any scientists who are listening, it's because I'm translating this into layperson speak. But in essence, like that's kind of a metaphor for what's happening. And and I've heard from so many people saying like I had to quit my job or like I work in, um, you know, I work in a, in a fast fashion store and the clothes smell so bad or I have breathing problems whenever I walk into a clothing store and I have to leave. So once you start digging, you start hearing these stories a lot, but you might not have noticed them before because because we tend to gaslight people or tell people that have these problems like oh it's just you or like wow you must be so sensitive or like are mm, you sure mm -hmm. or maybe it's just in your head or like all of these different things and uh so we sort of dismiss those concerns but once you op once you open that up and say like hey i believe you there's a me actual mechanism behind this the stories just ca start coming out of the woodwork yeah, no, I believe it. It's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, I've been surrounded by clothes my entire adult life, right? And mm -hmm. one of my, like, what basically began my career was working retail, which I did for three years. And we had just like tables and tables full of t shirts that I would fold. I would fold thousands of t shirts every day. And I, at the same time was developing this blistering eczema in my hands that was super painful. And I was just constantly covered with band-aids. And I can assure oh you God. like neither, well, first off, when you work retail, how often can you even afford to go to the doctor, right? But when right. I did finally see a doctor about it, like the fact that I was folding hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of garments every week and hanging them and unpacking them as they came in from shipment and all those things never came up in conversation. It was like, oh, what kind of soap are you using? Are right, you using right. a lotion? And it was like, no, no, no. And really, the moment I stopped folding all those clothes every day, my hand is healed, right? Crazy. And I'm just one of many, many people who are surrounded by clothes every day. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So now, now you're like, oh, okay. It's just like wild how it's like, oh, we never thought about it. And then you're like, have you thought about it? And it's like the connections start getting made. And it's like, oh my God, it's so obvious. I know. I'm seriously, as you were talking, I was thinking about all the people I have worked with over the years in my career and how many people were having autoimmune issues, chronic stomach and skin issues, the sheer volume of exotic eczema everybody was getting, you know, people who were suddenly developing asthma. Like it was just, it's, it's not surprising to me now that we're talking about it, especially, you know, uh, your PR person told me that there are more than 3,000 different chemicals used in fashion today with up to 50 of them present on a single garment. That is wild to me. That's so many chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not even the full story because uh, that came out from Nike many years ago. And there's mm. a lot of evidence that there's a lot more chemicals than just 3,000 used on fashion. So there's uh, more than 30,000 chemicals used in, in commerce today. And just the number of PFAS, estimated number uh, of this, mm -hmm. this class of chemicals that are used for water and stain repellency and other reasons, it's super toxic. It's been in the news. There's been settlements from Thanks Period Panties as well as 3M to help mm -hmm. clean up it in our drinking water. It's linked to thyroid disease, cancer, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, that there, the estimate for the number of PFAS chemicals has jumped from like 3,000 to 4,000 to 6,000 to 12,000 in the past few years. So 12,000 types of PFAS, just PFAS. So clearly there's more than 3,000 chemicals uh, present on our clothing. And a lot of them, as I discovered in my research, are not labeled, categorized, much less tested, right? So you go into PubChem. These, so these researchers from Duke told me that just dispersed dyes, um, which are used to dye polyester, they mm -hmm. were trying to research them and like they were, so there's this way, this thing called mass spectrometry, which um, like traditionally with testing, you look for, you have to know what you're looking for and you say like, okay, we're gonna look for these 50 chemicals and mm -hmm. um, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we have to know what they look like. We have to know their chemical signature and we're gonna look for each of them in a test. So it's very expensive. This new type of test, mass spectrometry, um, you 
you see everything in there and then you can start matching these chemical structures to what's in the literature. And they were like, we don't see this in the literature. Like these chemicals are being created and they're just not in there. And they were looking around and they were like, look, there's like 5,000 chemical signatures that look like dispersed dyes, but are not labeled and they're definitely not tested. So again, like wild, wild world out there of, you know, them saying like, well, there's not really a lot of evidence showing that they're safe. Well, there's not evidence showing that they're not safe. It's just a lack of evidence, a lack of research. (laughs) Yeah. We already touched on like flame retardants, which might be one that doesn't surprise people to hear is on clothing, but Mm -hmm. what, uh, but probably surprises them actually. Um, But what are other types of chemicals that are in our clothing? So dyes obviously probably mm-hmm. like washes to soften fabrics or mm-hmm. change the texture but what else so you also have the plasticizers that are used in synthetic materials to make them soft and pliable so that's phthalates bpa um other things something like dinch um so those are part of the plastics and those can migrate out of the plastics you also have finishes performance finishes you have anti-odor finishes you have pfas which provides that stain repellency and the water repellency quick dry properties you have uh anti-wrinkle and easy care finishes which usually involves either formaldehyde or can break down an off gas formaldehyde so and then there's like the processing chemicals and then there's contaminants so uh you know, you don't know where fashion has been. So a lot of times when it's being shipped from super humid, wet places with bugs and pests that America does not want, uh, there are pesticides applied to warehouses, fungicides applied to the clothing, um, and also applied to the shipping containers and the ships Mm -hmm. that transport these things. So those can be on there. And then And then the contaminants just from, you know, the processing, like lubricants and everything that's put on machinery, Uh, you know, just uh, like fashion goes through so many steps, like chemicals are applied, then chemicals are stripped off, then more chemicals are applied, then finishes are put on and dyes, softeners, you know, blah, 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 blah. The shipping happens. It's stored in a a dank warehouse somewhere. I mean, there's so much that happens to one piece of fashion then you have all the components and the threads and and Mm -hmm. all of those different things so it's it's there's i mean that fact that you said about up to 50 chemicals being found in one garment again those are the chemicals that they were looking for right that's not a comprehensive review of what's in what's in a garment I mean, and I think, you know, you touched on something that is really important that can't, cannot be forgotten, which is that, like, the process of creating our clothing is not as simple as one might, might imagine. I think people think, mm. like, oh, there's some fabric, it gets cut, someone sews it, and then somehow it's, like, in the store. But you touched on all the other points along the way where it's coming in contact with other environments, with other treatments. You know, I certainly have opened a box of samples from a vendor and been like, whoa, is this was this sprayed with gasoline? Like, you know, (laughs) or what? Like, I have coughed, I have dry heaved, I've had burning eyes after opening a box. And this is the same stuff that's going to be sold in stores and go Mm -hmm. home to your house and be on your body or the body of someone you love. So are, I mean, I already know the answer here, but I'm just going to ask it. Why are, are these regulated by the U.S. government? Barely. (laughs) (laughs) That was a better answer that I was going to be like, no, not at all. So barely is minor better. (laughs) There are. Why is that? Yeah, there are. It when it comes to the federal government, there are three chemicals that are regulated only in children's products: uh, some phthalates, um, lead, and cadmium. And I actually, so I visited uh, the marine and airport at. Newark in New Jersey. It's one of the biggest combined ports in the United States. And they uh, only check basically, uh, they tend to only check uh, even children's products that are um, fakes. So uh, there, if, if it's shipped in by a legitimate company um, and it's not, you know, a dupe, they, they will assume it's okay. 
and let it through. Wow. Yeah. That is and, wild. <laughs> and also, if you think about like you opening those boxes and coughing and dry heaving, more and more Americans are getting that, you know, before it would sort of off gas as it sits in the store and might not be as strong or if it was so bad maybe some like maybe a brand would pull it or something more and more americans are getting that experience because they're able to order products straight from the factory to their door and nobody is opening Mm -hmm. that bag and looking they could have anything in there and there are chemicals that are banned for all use and sale as a chemical in the United States, something like chloridane, which is a really strong pesticide, that was found on airline uniforms. And that, there's nothing illegal about that. There's literally nothing stopping a brand from, or a manufacturer from putting on a very banned chemical on clothing and then selling it to consumers, adult consumers. Wow. I mean, and, and for sure, like just based on my experience, pesticides and fungicides on clothing and other accessories or even home goods that you buy, not unusual, especially if they ship to via boat, because mm-hmm. otherwise they get to the dock, you know, like two months later and they open it and everything might be molded. Mm-hmm. Now, it, that's not me like making an excuse for it at all. I don't think it's cool, but I mean, it really speaks to the nature of our clothes being made so far away in such untransparent uh, supply chains that we we don't know what we're getting, but I see why it happens. Yeah, um, exactly. It's really, scary. it's really scary. So why is this such a big secret? Because I think for a lot of people who are listening to this, this is probably really shocking. It is shocking. And there's a few reasons I think it's it's a secret. One is that I had to be very stubborn and persistent to find this out myself because there is a lot of gaslighting that goes on. A lot of people who are experts are paid by the industry in some way. So they are incentivized, consciously or not, to downplay first of all they're not allowed to share all the things they've seen right so some of these labels are they're getting paid by brands to certify their stuff as non-toxic if something fails they don't Mm. share that they just tell the brand hey it failed you're not getting the certification and the brand can choose whether or not to clean it up so they can get the certification but they don't have to clean it up you know what i mean Mm -hmm. that It's a little bit different in California. The reason why we know so much at this point is that California has Prop 65. That's the reason why you see these labels that say like in the state of California, uh, this is, you know, this has uh, reproductive toxic and carcinogenic substances or something along those lines is because California doesn't say you can't have those chemicals. It just says if you have them, you have to label it. And so Mm -hmm. that has led some, uh, some, advocacy organizations such as the Center for Environmental Health to test products because they're incentivized to test things because then they can sue uh, or they can work with a public advocacy law firm to uh, put notice in and then sue these these brands for not following uh, the law on labeling because it's really expensive to get things tested i decided Mm -hmm. i wanted to go through this process i got five things tested not even for everything i wanted to get them tested for and it cost me almost ten thousand dollars oh my god wow yeah yeah i used half of my advance (laughs) (laughs) that year on (laughs) getting things tested so um that's another reason it's just a very 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 complicated subject and it was very ambitious and maybe perhaps stupid for me to take on this type of project because so many people still are saying what's your credentials you don't know anything you're just a, like <laughs> you're that. just yeah like you you know and i'm like well i talked to all these researchers who say this like oh well you're just fear mongering this isn't a big uh. deal because the well has been poisoned by mm-hmm. a lot of misinformation that's been going around especially in the wellness community 
And I get that when people see this and they don't know who I am and they don't know my work, they say they, they, you know, they don't want to buy into something that could potentially be misinformation. But I invite anybody, you know, even if they don't want to give me money, go check it out from the library and look through the citations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think you hit on a really good point there that because there has been so much misinformation, especially over the past few years, coming from the wellness community or people who were maybe weaponizing the wellness community to mm-hmm. meet their other ideological beliefs, right? I think that there is this, you know, concern about fear-mongering, but also, you know what, I th- I I mean, I don't know what you think, but I feel like we've just been really hearing about PFAS in a major impactful way for like the past 2 or 3 years, and we still don't know the full impact of them, but what we do know is that they're terrible. So, these conversations have to start somewhere. Um, and, you know, just because something is bad news doesn't mean that the person who delivered it doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but I totally, I mean, I get people do, pushing back on me with that kind of stuff all the time, too. And I'm like, how do I know this? Because I've worked in this industry for 20 years. Like, that's, yeah. that's how yeah. I know things, right? Um, it's interesting to, you talked about California. And I will tell you, I have worked for multiple employers who have been, who have been taken to court over things that were tested in California for ex- the exact reasons you were saying and discovered to contain materials or chemicals that were not, that needed to be labeled and were not. And, you know, what retailers have begun doing to sort of protect themselves from that because ultimately, like, they have so little insight or control over their supply chain, which is why we know all this that, or why a lot of this really fucked up shit happens, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because they, you know, like when you're trying to get the lowest price you can on and as fast as possible, this is what happens. You lose total insight into what's happening. Um, These retailers, rather than saying like, okay, I'm going to try to have more oversight, more transparency into my supply chain, what instead they're doing is requiring manufacturers to have insurance that covers this kind of litigation. I These know, poor I know. manufacturers, they always are on the losing <laughs> no. end of this. They like, really it's, are. It's yeah. it's ridiculous because, you know, so I, I did travel to India and visited some dye houses and I visited like a really good one that has all the certifications. They work with some of the big brands who care deeply about this and they said half the cost that so the the cost of running a proper water treatment system as required by law, actually, in Tirapur at this point, is like doubles the price of the dyed fabric. It's like, it's wow. insanely expensive. And they would only do it if it was required by law. I mean, they can't afford that because so many brands mm-hmm. will move from factory to factory. If if a, if a dye house goes to them and says, um, we know you care deeply about safe chemistry, the dyes that you're the certified dyes that you're requiring us to get the certifications that you're requiring us to pay for and the audits and you know the the water treatment system and the safety protocols that honestly slow down the speed of our workers will increase the price of each yard by or each each final piece of clothing by 3 cents the brand will say eh you know what the guy down the street says he doesn't need to charge that much more, so we're going to go to them. What do you think the guy down the street's doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally, right? Like, yeah. like, that's the thing. Like, I, you know, it's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing. And the all of these manufacturers are, they're put into this corner where it's like, do you want to not be able to pay your workers? Or do you want this, do you want, like, do you want this job? You know, like, yeah. You're going to have to, someone's going to have to suffer to meet the pricing we want as if that brand couldn't eat the three cents per unit. Um, That's really what it comes down to. I mean, it's the same thing with saying like, okay, well now, you know, we're going to close our eyes, put on, put on like our earmuffs and pretend we can't, we don't know what's happening or just absolve ourselves from knowing what's happening. And you're going to bear the repercussions of any litigation by having insurance for it, which is expensive. I have definitely dealt with vendors who are like, sorry, you can't order enough to make this worth my time. I mean, worth my money, you know, like, yeah, yeah. like it's so expensive. And yet that's when we, when brands are asking for that, that money also then comes out of the pockets of the people making the stuff. It trickles down, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a variety of ways that brands avoid culpability in this case. So the, the story of 
uh, for example, Alaska Airlines and Twin Hill, uh, which is a, a uniform manufacturer. So first what they did is they said, oh, it got contaminated on the boat. Then they said, oh, it's the fault of the particular place we ordered from. We are no longer working with them. And then they said, look, we've had things tested. There's nothing that we accidentally got on there that would cause this. I mean, there is Teflon, which uh, <sighs> we put on, on there clothing? on purpose. Yeah, because... It, that Teflon is PFAS. It is the stain yeah. proofing stuff. And they said, but that, we put that there on purpose. So like that couldn't be it. And Ugh. this is in 2011. Believe me, the news was out that PFAS is toxic. It's just, it was just this time where, and I, hopefully this book can pull us, yank us forward out of this, where people said, it doesn't matter what's on your clothing. You're not eating your clothing. That is so not true. Okay, putting aside the fact that infants literally stuff clothing in their mouths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We now know that microfibers of synthetic and natural break off of clothing when we wash them and when we wear them. And they mm -hmm. end up in our house dust. And so mm -hmm. when they're in our house dust and floating around, aside from just the VOCs of volatile organic compounds that are floating off our clothes, that's what you're smelling when you smell clothing, we are ingesting those microfibers. We are s smelling in those things. And also when we sweat, sweat pulls whatever's in the fabric out onto your skin. And especially with like endocrine disruptors and certain chemicals, those can soak into the skin. Now there needs to be more research about dermal transfer. That is a big hole that is the next step forward. Mm -hmm. And that lack, that hole in the research is being weaponized against researchers and against advocates who are saying this is a problem by saying, well, we don't know how much. So like, let's wait until the next five years of incredibly expensive research comes through. And then and then maybe we can talk about it. But, you know, like, I, you know, like, we can get hormone patches as birth control. So, like, why right. is it not a no. problem that I we're know, wearing this against our skin? Yeah, I hear this all the time, actually, that, like, well, we don't know about anything. Like, or people will say literally, like, oh, absorbing stuff through your skin is a myth. And I'm like, there are multiple, many vet medications that are patches. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that those are a scam? Or do they work? Because if they work, then some stuff goes through your skin. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's been some work by some sort of anti-wellness influencers who are like, this is a myth, this is a myth. And I think people have swung too hard in the other direction where they're saying like, not all chemicals can be absorbed through the skin or there's no evidence that like we absorb whatever writ made up number of what put a is put on our skin. It doesn't mean that nothing can go through our skin. It just means there is a hole in the research. And again, in the United States, we ha we te we tend to take a or we always take a innocent until proven guilty. Now it takes millions and millions and millions of dollars and 10 to 20 years to prove a chemical guilty. And that especially for something like PFAS or heavy metals, which build up in the body, PFAS never goes away. The more PFAS we make, the more we have, right? It's it's called mm -hmm. a plugged bathtub. It does not go away. And so we don't have time to prove definitively that this is causing people to get sick. It might never be exactly provable because we wear so many different pieces of clothing every day mm -hmm. that un like most of the evidence we have comes from workers, factory workers who are in factories that make these textiles and are exposed to a measurable amount of different things like formaldehyde over the course of their employment. And also there was a Harvard study that showed that Alaska Airlines attendants, uh, a lot of their symptoms like breathing problems, rashes, multiple chemical sensitivity doubled after the introduction of the uniform. So we have pretty strong evidence, but for you and me, because we're exposed to such a variety of things, if we had a few pieces of toxic clothing, it might take us a really long time to figure mm -hmm. out what's causing our problems. I've talked to women who who finally found out after they went in for a patch test that they were allergic to certain dispersed dyes. Blue and black usually comes up because that's what people are tested for the most. And they've told me, I will buy clothing and then I will wear it and then I'll wait three days to see if a reaction shows up in those three days. So 
it could take a really long time to figure it out. It's almost like you have to go on an, a clothing and exposure elimination diet, right? Like just wear <laughs> white, undyed, unfinished, super non-toxic clothing and put use no, you know, creams or like any soap or anything for a couple of weeks and then start adding things back in to see what happens. I mean, it certainly would slow down shopping for a lot of people. So maybe this isn't the worst idea. <laughs> but yeah. it's interesting, like, I mean, obviously, like, you know, uh, flame retardants and dyes have been in use for a really long time at this point, like since the mass protection of clo- mass production of clothing began in the middle of the last century. You know, polyesters came later, but they weren't as prevalent until this century. So I'm wondering, now that we live in this, like, golden era, and I mean that a little snidely, this golden era of synthetic fabrics where so much of our clothing is synthetic or a blend. Do you think that this has become a bigger issue in the past 10 or 20 years with the rise of fast fashion? Absolutely. I do think it, I mean, clothing has always been toxic. Let's be clear about that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, There has been mercury in hats. And then uh, there was then there was the invention of green, arsenic green, and then the invention of fossil fuel dyes, and then the invention of plastic. So it's always been around. We keep inventing new fun ways to poison ourselves with our fashion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And none of this was ever banned, by the way. It would just sort of like kind of fall out of favor, but it wasn't banned. And so when we started outsourcing all of our pra- but like 97% of our fashion production to countries that have not very strong environmental and labor protections, there's nothing stopping those manufacturers who, like we just discussed, don't cannot invest in safe technology or safe chemistry because they're not paid enough. There's nothing stopping them from using those things that the fashion industry says, claims they have phased out. So things like... There are certain azure dyes that have been banned in Europe and that the fashion industry says they have phased out and certain brands restrict. But you test clothing and they they show up again. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things, like mercury was never banned for use in manufacturing hats, except in Connecticut. It was used in the UK until the 1960s. I mean, people think this is like a Victorian era thing, but like (laughs) the only reason why we don't use it anymore is because we don't make or wear men's hats out of rabbit fur anymore. That's the only reason. So ha- you're saying that there's never been like really a, a sweeping recall or ban on anything relating to fashion? Just in Europe. So Europe in the last decade has banned over 30 chemicals specifically for the use of textiles. You can go online to something called Rapex and you can see the different products that the EU has tested, destroyed, sent back, blocked. Uh, there's not a ton of stuff. You know, they can't check every shipment, but they are doing something. The US doesn't really do that, save for California. There's some specific PFAS regulation coming in in New York and um, California and Washington and Maine. Uh, but yeah, there's just a lot of like, trust us. <laughs> we got your back <laughs> going on. It's interesting. Like I, or maybe it's not interesting. It's depressing. I remember one of my first buying jobs, one of the categories I worked on was shoes. And we had an issue with these like slip on sort of like slippery things that were like, I don't know, they were like $12 a pair. And we were selling just like thousands upon thousands of them every week. And someone reached out to customer service and was like, these shoes gave me a chemical burn. And it was like suddenly, it was like someone opened a door just a little bit and the door just slammed open. And we were receiving a lot of messages of that nature. Like I got a weird rash on my foot. I went to the doctor and they said it was a chemical burn. And like, obviously as the buyer, like this was out of my hands, like legal took it on and we didn't buy those shoes anymore. But I always thought it was really interesting that, we were selling inadvertently or otherwise a pair of shoes that probably looked innocent enough, but were somehow giving people what based on the photos I saw appeared to be chemical burns. It's crazy because there have been multiple lawsuits from, from consumers against Carter's, uh, the children's wear brand for tags um, Mm -hmm. 
and uh, Victoria's Secret in 2008 for bras that gave consumers chemical burns. <gasps> and uh, <laughs> and then, you know, there's there have been instances where uh, the CPSC, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, has gotten hundreds or thousands of reports of chemical burns. And the CPSC doesn't really do much about it. They sort of like, mm. I think they try to talk to the brand and say like, it would be great if you voluntarily recalled this, but the brands don't really have to do it. And to avoid culpability, I didn't get, I wanted to talk about this earlier and I forgot. I, I went off, off on a tangent, but, um, to avoid culpability, the brand says, okay, prove which chemical it was. Oh my God. Of course. And I told you that I, got something tested for like 130. I got some stuff tested for 130 chemicals and a few of them failed and it cost me $10,000. So which consumer, like even if with the help of a law firm, so a lot of times they're like, it's formaldehyde because formaldehyde has been in the news. It could be so many things. And a lot of times they're like, what's the one chemical? Because they'll say like, if you're like, it's formaldehyde, they're like, ah, but formaldehyde has doesn't have proven links to like these symptoms that they're having well it could be that a lot of different chemicals are doing a lot of different things um acting synergistically supporting each other like doing all these crazy things and so you the epidemiology is really hard to sort out def definitively because it's like which chemical is doing what like what do these mixes do when they come together was it what is it off gassing all of these different things so the brands have gotten out of all of these lawsuits by saying prove which chemical it is and when consumers can't or the law firms can't they they get out of it and they there's a lot of victim blaming the carter ceo at the time they had more than three thousand reports from parents who were just beside themselves right and mm -hmm. they were like ah well you know it's i have the exact quote in the book but they the ceo basically said well you know there's a few sensitive babies out there it's the oh. babies not our product <laughs> I and love they offer like, refunds. oh, you're sensitive, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not a rarity. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that somewhere around one fifth of people have chemical sensitivities, reactions, autoimmune diseases, like all of these different things that are linked. So it's not a rare thing. I mean, as soon as I started talking about this thing, it's like all the time people are like, oh yeah, I have an autoimmune disease. Oh yeah, I can't do sense. Oh, my sister is like, extremely sensitive my mom my like it's 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 all around us and yet we still act like it's this rare thing that like two sensitive people are foisting upon us i almost think it should become another type of disability that needs to be accommodated for mm, yeah yeah i mean i think it's interesting. I, I was reading anecdotally on because I was I spent a lot of time doom scrolling Reddit. Um, and I went down a rabbit hole of a bunch of reading about, you know, more and more people are being di diagnosed with autoimmune diseases, more mm -hmm. and more people are developing allergies, skin conditions related to autoimmune issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's like, nobody knows why, right? Is so it mysterious. <laughs> so mysterious. I know. And I'm like, yeah, it seems pretty straightforward to me that it's the chemicals around us, the chemicals in our clothes, and also all the highly processed food we're being fed. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. It's scary. So you can feel sort of like doomed, right? Like, mm -hmm. how can I... I'm, I'm just doomed to suffer right <laughs> so that's like a really that would be a very dark note for us to like be like okay well that's all have thanks everyone bye good night so, and good luck <laughs> yeah uh god bless uh i thought maybe we could talk about what we can do as individuals um to protect ourselves and other people because this is definitely like i guarantee people who are listening to this might be freaked out a little bit but maybe they're not going to start getting freaked out until they get into bed tonight. So let's just like stop that now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are there are definitely things that you, that one can do to protect themselves and their family. There's actually a, a lot of control that one can exert. Now I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to caveat this by saying that I don't think this should be the situation. I think the government should be protecting us more. I think brands should be yeah. held accountable for what they put in there. And I don't think you know people have so many different priorities that you know, it's hard to even just feed your family healthy food for a lot of people. So like adding another thing to people's plate is not my ideal outcome. However, if this is concerning to you uh, and you want to protect your family and um, you're having, you have some sort of 
uh, illness that or something that I describe in the book. So I've I've linked this to autoimmune disease, infertility, skin conditions, uh, multiple chemical sensitivity, and uh, what uh, cancer, you know, all these different things. So um, the first thing I would do is don't buy ultra fast fashion. So anything that um, drop ships from uh, Asia <laughs> that you've never heard of before and is mm-hmm. on Amazon. And I'm confident saying Amazon because there's been like weird recalls of Amazon uh, products, including children's shoes because of toxicity. And so um, there's all these gibberish brands that you see on social media. Advertising <laughs> I on social like media. it the gibberish. I, that is exactly what they are. Uh. Yeah. Um, so they, so avoid those for sure. Mm-hmm. They're super, super dangerous. And uh, it's just, and also like they're just bad value. They never look like their picture. So I don't even, I wouldn't even recommend it. Yeah. And they like, copy and steal ideas right like yeah i mean i will tell you like i because i just like observing people so much i belong to a lot of different facebook groups that otherwise would be of no interest to me if i weren't just like a creep who likes to see what people talk about (laughs) and there are a lot of these facebook groups for like dupes of like brands and specifically they're all like they're getting them all from dropship brands like these gibberish Wait, by dupes do you mean total scams <laughs> no no like total duplicates yeah yeah Sorry, you're not up in the dupe scene like me but you're right i could see i mean when you think about it that way like who's getting duped here right yeah um, totally. but i see like people it bums me out so hard because someone will be like oh i really love sulky but i can't afford it so i bought these five dresses from insert assortment of vowels and consonants here right and they all arrived and then they show the photos and some of them look better than others but when i see them i mean one i get sad because i'm like wow like those are uh, copies of someone else's hard work but i am just like what's what is that really like what's the fabric who made it how was it made like i have so many questions um and that stuff's not necessarily like cheap anymore either Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just I, I see it as a waste of your money because like they don't take returns, you know, they're just like I'm so stressful. <laughs> they don't even like respond to your email. Uh, so so avoid those. Um, I would go for natural fabrics whenever possible. Be, the, it doesn't mean they're perfect. It's not a hard and fast rule, but synthetic fabrics are more likely to contain some of these endocrine disruptors and uh, definitely mm-hmm. the dispersed dyes and things like that. So go for those. Um, patronize or look for labels like Okotex, Blue Sign, and to a lesser extent, GOTS. Those indicate that there's certifications, a stronger relationship, things like that. Uh, I um, I also have lists on EcoCult for a lot of different product categories of non-toxic, safe, sustainable brands. I'm going to come out soon with a mass market brand listing because uh, so a lot of people are asking, they're like, I love, yeah, love supporting tiny brands, but this is a little bit out of my price point. So yeah, I totally mm-hmm. get it. So there's a lot of big brands who care deeply about their reputation, even what so what you would consider fast fashion brands that are, are very concerned about this. Um, so that's another thing to look for and uh, avoid performance qualities, mm-hmm. performance yeah. and promises. If it promises <laughs> to be anti-odor, uh, stain repellent, water repellent, quick dry, um, anti-wrinkle, easy care, all of these different things, it's usually achieved with a uh, a finish, uh, a chemical finish, unless otherwise clearly stated. So avoid those things. And uh, if it smells bad, send it back. <laughs> That's a good call because I rarely buy new clothes at this point in my life, but I have definitely, I had a very dark period in the late, uh, 2010s where I was ordering a lot from Zara and Forever 21 and I would frequently get clothes that smelled like I would just say oh these smell like cancer you know <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it was so it was so interesting because when I visited this one dye house so I visited two dye houses one was not great one was great but in the great dye house they were printing uh children's pajamas with these characters on them and when I got up close, it smelled like a budget nail salon. It smelled like, you know, when you walk into a nail salon and you're yeah. like, it smells like cancer. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is like not unusual, like to be working in the buying office and get a bunch of samples and like everybody has to take them out into the hallway 
to yeah. air out. Like it is this is this is real, especially when we start talking about like, you know, fake leather, aka vegan leather and other mm-hmm. like uh definitely one hundred percent plastic, sometimes very obvious plastic items, mm-hmm. like that that is where it gets like super scary. But I have also smelled like I said, that weird gasoline, pesticide, fungicide smell on natural fibers too. So it's important yeah. to, I agree, just like return it if it smells. Yeah, absolutely. That was the one thing that Pete, like every all the experts agreed upon. It was sort of like, they'd be like, it's not a big deal. I mean, yeah, sure. If it smells bad, return it. So that's like the one thing that even <laughs> the people who are defending the industry are like, I mean, yeah, if it smells bad, return it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And who knows what they'll do with it. I mean, in the era of e-commerce, I don't know if they would be like, oh, we're going to send this, we're going to hold the vendor accountable, maybe if if enough people sent it back. But I also know that they're not going to like hang it up and air it out because that's not how warehouses work. No. no. So I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I always feel like the way we force change if we're going to buy stuff is by like being very selective about what, we're, what we buy and where we mm-hmm. buy it. Um, but this chemical one is really hard because it's, it's really so big hard. Yeah. yeah 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 i call it a, a hyper object so hyper objects are things that are like so huge that you can't see it all at once and you can't wrap your mind around it and yeah. the the travel of chemicals through our supply chain and through our world is definitely a hyper object definitely it's like trying to imagine the size of the universe your brain just <laughs> hits a wall pretty fast yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the other thing, I mean, I don't I don't know about this. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very, I'm, I'm not this. I'm such a like instant gratification person, or at least I was when I was buying a lot of fast fashion. You know, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, well, if I buy something, I wash it before I wear it. Do you think that that makes an impact? It does. Yeah, yeah. it does, because it can wash off a lot of the contaminants, the things that are, you know, if the dye is crocking or coming off, uh, mm-hmm. washing it a few times can help. It's not going to get rid of everything. If there's a PFAS coating, that PFAS coating is going to stay on there. It's meant to stay on there. Um, and make sure you wash it in a non-toxic, unfragranced, fragrance-free laundry detergent because those detergents that have fragrances, those fragrances are designed to stick to your clothing for a long time. It's really Ugh. hard to get them off. So um, if you do go to the dermatologist with skin reactions, they'll ask you about soaps and stuff. They'll also ask you, what detergent are you using? And so that's a very, uh, a big known skin sensitizer. I believe that. I have like a very visceral response to the smell of gain, which I know many people like. But to me, it is like a an, an nausea inducing immediately. And that's one of those ones like it's there's nothing worse than buying something on Poshmark or Depop, opening the envelope and you're like, oh, shit, it's like yeah. a game bouquet. And you end up having to wash it many times to get rid of that smell because it is like on there. Yeah, it it's on there for sure. I yeah. That's one of the reasons why I actually like to go thrifting in person just because with all the shipping back and trying things on and, oh, I miss the return thing, like thrift shopping and just shopping in general in person, you can smell the clothes, you can try them on. Um, I I don't think it saves you so much time to order things online because like, I mean, it does if you're looking for something really super specific, but um, yeah, you you could like, I've ordered things from, I've ordered a lot of things from the real real actually. And like, usually they get in and I'm like, Okay, cool. We're okay. <laughs> yeah, you you'll know when you've been gained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really good advice. I think that we tend to forget about laundry detergent and I was reading how some of well, for one, the pods uh also deposit plastic onto your clothing and like even these like I don't know, they're like sh- detergent sheets. Oh, God, the the fabric softeners and the dryer sheets. First of all, they don't do shit, okay? They do not do shit, yeah. Don't buy them. I mean, you could get... I haven't used detergent sheets for my entire adult life. No, me neither. They're so silly. And like like you said, they don't make static go away, if that's what you're battling. (laughs) They just deposit a ton of very talk there are studies that i cite my book that say that like the air coming out of those dryer vents is incredibly toxic because all those things combine and come out and like they they turn into chemicals that are like banned and restricted in the united states um 
for use in sale. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. The other thing I would say is don't dry clean your clothes if you can help it. I haven't gone to the dry cleaner in a really long time. I just take a spray of water and vinegar or water and vodka. I just rescued a new silk blouse the other day. I spilled coffee on it and the coffee came out when I used a spot cleaning solution of vinegar and water. And that will deodorize and uh, vodka and water will also deodorize. So if you can, um, and most things that say that they are dry clean only, it's they're just being overly cautious. Mm -hmm. It's true. They don't want you to wash it, damage it, and then try to return it. Right. right. Um, You know, most things are totally fine to hand wash. Yeah. Dry cleaning is, I mean, we've talked about it at length on Clothes Worse in the Past, but it's really bad. And I was clued into that as a teenager when I thrifted a dress for my prom and my mom said, I'm going to get a dry clean for you, which made me feel so like what a luxury, total adult now, right? Getting dry mm-hmm. cleaning. And I took it out of the bag the night of prom and I put it on and I felt like so adult. And within 30 minutes, my whole my skin was on fire. <gasps> I broke out in hives from like a neck. It was a maxi dress, oh, high neck no. maxi dress from the 70s. So like uh, hives from like my neck to my ankles. Um, still had a great prom, but you know. Oh like, my God. I was like, huh, could dry cleaning do that? My mom was like, oh, it's because she's wearing old clothes but it was definitely the dry cleaning and that's the only time I've dry cleaned anything in my life and I'm doing just fine I promise no one needs to dry clean <laughs> yeah I mean the dry, what's crazy is I did a lot of research n- none of it really made it into the book but I did a ton of research on super fund sites in the United States especially related to fashion so these are sites they're called super fund because the EPA created a super fund full of money to help cl- remediate toxic fashion sites. And a lot of them are outside of dye factories, old dye factories, old fashion factories. And a lot of them that are incredibly toxic are underneath dry cleaning stores, uh, old dry cleaning stores. Yeah, I was reading how just like one drop can go through the floor into the soil under the facility. I mean, it's like no joke. It's, yeah. I mean, I you know, before... Uh, dry cleaning chemicals were invented. Uh, they were washing things with gasoline. I don't know if it's an improvement. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I know. I know. Like, there are green dry cleaners. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. sure how much better the quote unquote green dry cleaners are. And then there's, um, I think it's called like critical CO2 cleaners, which is like mm-hmm. the best. But they're they're a little bit hard to find. Yeah, yeah. The dr- I did a bunch of research into the green dry cleaning thing, and it's like, it's one of those, like, no one really knows if it's that much better. But right. the CO2 is supposed to be the best. But yeah, I have, like, I haven't found a place. I mean, I don't, it's not like I'm looking very hard. I don't plan on dry cleaning my clothes anyway. But I know that there are sometimes you're just like, I cannot save this thing, and it could be an option. It makes sense to me that that would be very effective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, dry cleaning laundry detergent. I mean, it's just like, it's just all around us. I mean, we could do a whole episode just talking about all those like Glade plugins and stuff. <gasps> I know they're so bad. And uh, there's, it. there's like, obviously I couldn't talk about that, but they're, uh, uh, so if somebody's allergic to a Glade plugin, like they need to get that out of their home, their home experience. And I think, you know, this, I have a lot of, I used to live in the suburbs. I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for women who are sort of who live in the suburbs because I, I in New York City, none of my friends use Glade plugins, but like you get to the suburbs and rural areas and it's like Yankee Candle Glade Plugin City. Oh man, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like the the it's sort of like people try to talk to their friends saying, like, hey, this gives me a headache. And it's like, you can pry my scented products after out of my cold dead fingers type of attitude. And it's just <laughs> I'm hoping that like this book provides like a little bit of like I'm not crazy. This is real fodder for some of these conversations. I mean, I love that because I think a lot of us have, whether we've been gaslit unintentionally by others or gaslighting ourselves, we think we're the problem because we're sensitive. But really what you're hitting on are some like essential truths here that are that are science. It's not just us being sensitive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm really excited for everyone to read your book. <laughs> Thank you. And tell everyone about it. Well, thank you so much, Alden. Do you have any last words you want to share with, or if you don't, that's cool too. I'm just so excited that this is causing a lot of excitement in people and people are identifying with it and giving me a lot of wonderful feedback. I mean, the reviews have been really good. And I would just say like, 
give the book a chance, even if you think, uh, even if you think it sounds far fetched. I think once people get into it, it's there's a lot of convincing, not only scientific evidence, but um, stories from all sorts of people about the way this has impacted them. And uh, I hope you can start a movement. Yeah, I love that. Okay, thank you. Thank yes. you. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? 
Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Thanks to Alden for spending some time with us and sharing so much helpful, albeit scary, information with us. Please read her book, To Die For, How Toxic Fashion is Making Us Sick and How We Can Fight Back. I plan on reading it as soon as I'm done with my job in another week. You should read it too so we can talk about it. You can also find more of Alden's writing and a lot of helpful information at ecocult.com. And I'll share a link to that in the show notes. I also recommend signing up for the EcoCult newsletter, which comes into my inbox every week and always inspires me and gets me riled up. Ultimately, we talk about some scary and depressing stuff around here. And Alden's findings on the chemicals in our clothing definitely can be described as by both of those adjectives. But that doesn't mean we have the luxury of pretending that we didn't hear any of this, right? Because once again, we can see how the clothing industry is having a negative impact on every single person in this world. Me and you and everyone we know. It's not, as some of us might have once believed, I know I did, a problem that is far away, happening somewhere we'll probably never visit. In fact, the repercussions of the fashion industry are playing out in every one of our closets, within our bodies, and in the world around us. It scares the shit out of me. It makes me so angry and it also makes me so sad it's easy to feel those feelings and kind of shut down because sometimes it just feels like life is too big and too hard already why add more fear and anger to the mix i get it this is my day-to-day conversation with myself but We can't ignore it. We have to receive the information, process it, grieve the implications of it all, including grieving the realization that big business has been intentionally misleading you for a long time, or at the very least, lying by omission. We need to grieve all of that. We need to grieve the horrific truth about how our clothes are made and how it impacts the planet and its people. We have to grieve the fact that we are being sold clothing that is making us sick. We need to grieve the knowledge that garment workers are paid pennies and work under terrible conditions while also handling these fabrics that are making them sick. We need to grieve the fact that 85% of our unwanted, barely worn clothes end up in a landfill. And we need to grieve the impact all of that fast fashion has had on our planet, its people, and its animals when we're done with it. It's okay to be sad and angry. I know I am. But the question I ask myself every day is, What are you going to do with that? That's the big thing. That's the important thing. It's easy to give up to say, I'm one person. I can never have an impact on the world. But you know by now that that is not true. 
operating alone, yeah, sure, you won't have much of an impact at all. But when you're working with other people, a community like ours that is turning into a movement, big change can happen. When I hear people say like, oh, I don't know, Amazon has such a bigger impact on the world and there's nothing I can do about it, that's just giving yourself permission to give up. Because the reality is that we have been letting Amazon and every other company out there do whatever the heck they want to us for years now. And it turns out that we cannot trust them to do the right thing. They aren't going to change without us. We have to demand it and we have to do it together. We have a major opportunity right now to demand change from brands, from our governments, and from ourselves. And we can do that together by learning the facts and unifying, sharing our knowledge and experience, supporting one another, welcoming others into the movement, and educating those around us. I know we can do that. So who's in? Let's go. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. Written, researched, edited, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating, maybe even, if you're feeling extra spicy, a review on Apple Podcasts. But most importantly, tell your friends. That's that's how we turn this into a movement, right? If you'd like to support my work financially, which I would super, super duper appreciate, uh, you can learn more at patreon.com slash close horse podcast, or you can check out the links in my Instagram bio where you'll find me. You all know this by now, but just in case as at close horse podcast. Thanks as always to my other half, Dustin Travis White for letting me once again, turn off the air conditioning on a 104 degree day so that we can get the best sounding audio. <laughs> And also, thank you, Dustin, for our music and audio support. All right, I'll see you all next week. Bye.